Um, Kamran is an artist educator. He teaches over at HPU, locally grown artist. Uh, and he'll give you a little bit more of his background, and then we'll talk about logo design and how it pertains to you guys. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I'm Kamran. Uh, happy to be here to tell you guys a little bit about myself and then specifically talk about the a logo I designed for the Honolulu printmakers. So a little of my background, um, I grew up on the Big Island and moved here to Honolulu maybe 15 years ago or something like that um, to go to college. And I started out at KCC. And my whole life, I always was an artist and drew and stuff, but wasn't really sure if that's what I wanted to go into to study. And I started out taking just some digital art classes at KCC, probably kind of similar to what you guys are taking here. Um, and that's kind of where I got my start. Uh, so digital art, did that for a little while, then transferred to UH and went into the graphic design program, which is, some of you might know, it's a little bit more um, maybe rigorous or technical um, in terms of like content and concept, emphasizing graphic design and communication and things like that, typography. Uh, so I did that for about a year and a half, and I also started taking some printmaking classes. So screen printing in particular. Have any of you guys taken printmaking or screen printing? <laughs> OK. So um, yeah, it, it's a, a form of art. I'll talk a little bit about different printmaking techniques. But it was a lot more open-ended and kind of free-flowing, which I really appreciated. So I sort of stopped taking formal graphic design classes and continued working as a graphic designer on my own, kind of freelance, while I pursued more of an art kind of course load, um, fine arts or visual arts. So um, I graduated with my BFA in 2010 in printmaking, and then worked as a graphic designer for a while for, for here, and then lived in New York City for a year and a half, did graphic design there, ultimately moved home and started grad school. And actually, I did grad school at UH, um, and I started in printmaking, and I also kind of developed into sculpture as well. So I do a bunch of different things, but today I'm mostly going to talk about my work as a graphic designer, and particularly this logo, which I did about five years ago. So the Honolulu Printmakers is an organization that has been around for like 91 years. So it's been here for a while. Um, of course, based in Honolulu. And, but it's a group of printmakers, so a community of artists that live in all of the Hawaiian Islands. So it's not just people that live in Honolulu. That's just where it was founded. So this was the original Honolulu Printmakers logo. Um, again, it's founded in 1918, so a very old organization. Uh, been around for a long time, has a lot of history in Hawaii. and. This was not their original logo, but this was a logo that someone created for them long, long ago. So you can kind of tell from the style of the logo. Um, it looks very kind of traditional and classic and has that sense of history to it, right? It looks aged. Um, the letter forms, the typeface that is chosen, it looks uh, yeah, very traditional. But also the effect here, so this kind of black and white these little black dots, it's called chatter. And that's something that's actually created when you're making a print and you're carving from a wood block. You carve with a tool. And where you don't carve, sometimes there's these little raised parts. And when you ink it up, those little raised parts collect ink. And so it adds kind of a nice character or sort of a rough look to it. So anyway, the, this original logo has a little bit of that printmaking element incorporated into the logo. But um, about five years ago, they decided, the printmakers decided they wanted to update or renew their logo. So I was asked by the executive director to create a new logo for them. And this is what he wanted. So they wanted something modern. They wanted a reference to Hawaii or Honolulu. Um, it had to reference printmaking as a tradition because that's what the organization is all about. And I'll talk more about printmaking in a second. 
they wanted the logo to be simple and straightforward. So this logo is not very simple, right? It's pretty complex. It's large. The letter forms are very fancy. Um, there's a lot of uh, embellishments and you know details and um, so they wanted simplicity and they wanted versatility and these kind of go hand in hand. So versatility is sort of able to be used or recognized at a variety of sizes. And this logo has a lot of character and it's very classic, but it didn't functional, function very well small. It's mostly good really large. If it was this big, you couldn't really read it, right? Or it wouldn't be recognizable. So that's something that they really wanted to um, emphasize in the new logo design. So these are the requirements. And this is a little bit about printmaking. So some of you might know this already. Um, just some examples of people in the process of carving wood blocks. So carving out. Printmaking is all about positive and negative space. So that's something that you guys have probably learned a little bit about so far, right? And you will, I'm sure, in the rest of this course. Uh, so these are four, the four main different types of print or print medium. There's relief printmaking, where the ink is on the surface, and then you carve below the surface of the block. So there's the positive and then the negative spaces. Intaglio is the opposite. It's where you carve or you scrape away from the surface, but the ink actually goes on the inside of what you scrape. And the surface is empty. So again, positive and negative. Um, lithography is like using a thick, very smooth stone, stone and painting or drawing on the stone surface. And that area you draw collects ink to then be printed on a paper. And then screen printing is you create a stencil. And the stencil has an open space that ink can flow through. And so the ink goes through in that area and makes positive form and negative space. So again, so positive and negative space was really important in this logo. But also creating something that kind of has to do with some of these mediums or this printmaking tradition. So another thing that was required was have some relevance to or reference to Hawaii. So um, the Hawaiian technique of kapa patterns, it's pretty ancient. And it was here way before printmaking was introduced, Western style printmaking. But this is a form of printmaking. And in fact, this is re relief printmaking, like I just pointed out before. So here, they carve away from the wooden tools. And then there's a positive space, which is the raised part. And then the negative space is below. So they apply ink and then press it onto a surface to create a pattern or texture. So here's some more um, kappa patterns. So we really wanted to sort of use some of this, um, this stylized or the uh, visual elements that kappa patterns use, but try and you know, bring it into the printmaker's logo because of our location here in Hawaii. So, um, once we started, well, so I started with just working on the typeface before I wanted to tackle the actual logo element. So because Duncan, the executive director, wanted something very straightforward and clean and modern, um, I just chose to start with a very simple typeface. In this case, these are called sans serif or sans serif fonts, um, different than the original logo. So these guys have done a little bit with typefaces yet, or not, not, yet. not yet? OK. Some of them know, but just go on. OK. So these, this is called the serif font. Some of you might know that. Um, the letter forms have kind of a flare at the bottom. And we've all seen these letters out in the world, right? Like Times New Roman is a very classic example. Um, so this sort of typeface has a very classic, traditional look to it. It's very easy to read, but a sans serif font is seen as much more modern. It doesn't have the frills and the little uh, things that aren't necessary nowadays. So all of these fonts are kind of stripped away. They're just simple, basic, modern. Um, 
And the fonts that I usually use in my logo design tend to be all sans serif. So that's sort of part of my style. And so Duncan really wanted us to stick with a modern kind of streamlined typeface. So these are some different examples using different sans serif fonts that I put together. Again, they're all pretty similar, but you can see some are more condensed. The letter forms are kind of smashed almost. Um, others have a little more space between. Thin, thick, um, and a little bit of positive negative space play here. White letters on a black background and here as well. But it's not emphasized that much. Um, so this is just a little bit of some of the experiment with text. And ultimately, I decided, or we decided, on using a font called Universe, which is really nice because it's available in a bunch of different weights and sizes and styles. So like this one up here, you can see it's very condensed, very thin letters. The letter forms are very narrow. But then there's also much more bold um, weights available. So this is the typeface we ended up going with. Um, but I also wanted to kind of play around with just using the letters, the H and the P, and trying to translate into the, them into some sort of logo design, too. So there were a whole bunch more samples than this, but here's just a few. Um, just five different variations of H and P. So the positive and negative space is pretty apparent in this one, um, where the actual letter forms are absent, and what you see is the negative space between the letters. But it's also legible. You can see the H and the P. But that didn't really look the way we wanted, and it doesn't reference you know, Hawaii or printmaking, so it didn't work. Um, this one, I kind of added little points on the, the top and bottom of the letters to refer reference like a scraper or carving into material. But the logo I didn't feel like was very elegant or unique necessarily. Um, this one is actually the closest to the logo we ended up using, but it also is not very legible. And as someone in the previous class mentioned, it kind of looks like an NP, even though it was sort of supposed to be an HP. So it's not very uh, recognizable or um, straightforward or clear that way. So I sort of scrapped the idea of using just the letter forms, the H and the P, to make a logo. And I just wanted to focus on simple geometry. So some of these probably look kind of like your projects that you guys are working on. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see. Um, just distilling down to pure geometric forms. And in this case, very inspired by those kappa patterns that I showed you. So just triangles, diagonal lines, again, positive and negative space. Um, and just repeating triangles was kind of the most straightforward, simple, um, pure sort of form that I, I liked using. And so these are just some versions of those compositions. And so this was ultimately the typeface that Duncan and I d agreed on. So it was that universe type that I showed you. So I just experimented with adding some of those different logo designs and in incorporating them into the typeface. So these are eight different ones. And ultimately, we decided that this one was kind of the best. Most of these are also um, symmetrical. This one is not quite. So it has a nice sort of asymmetrical balance in it, which creates a little more visual interest. It's not so obvious as the other ones. So ultimately, this is the logo that I ended up creating. And you can kind of see it here in three different uses. So it's the same logo, the same font, or same type, but displayed in different proportions to each other. And that's one thing that we both really liked about this combination of this logo and this typeface, is that it works at different scales. So you can emphasize the logo, the image itself, or you can emphasize the text and the name and have the logo be kind of an accent. So it has that versatility, right? Um, 
one other thing that's kind of interesting about this logo is when it's in a frame, so here you can kind of just see it's in like a, the black line around it, it really reads as a triangle kind of pointing down, right? And so to me, it looks like a triangle or a, an object kind of resting on the surface or inside of this frame, this rectangle. But when the rectangle is gone, you can really see these elements kind of stand apart from the negative space. So these positive forms kind of pop out. Whereas here, when they're contained in the box, the white area almost becomes a positive form itself, even though generally we think of as black is positive, white is negative. But these negative spaces have their own kind of positive uh, presence because of that border. So this was the logo that I came up with. And basically, it's just two triangles just rotated slightly. But it's a positive negative. Um, it's also sort of uh, can be seen as like a scraper or a tool digging into a surface. So this triangle here, you know, digging or contacting that bottom part. Um, it references the kappa patterns that I showed you a little earlier. It also is a very loose kind of abstracted H and then a P. Now, it's not important for it to be readable in that sense. But if you know, it's sort of a little kind of bonus um, that it's roughly based on those letter forms. So we kind of like that, too. And there's also that movement, the simplicity, um, the clarity. It works really well printed super small. And it can work printed really big. So this is the logo that we agreed on. And so these are just some applications of how we kind of played with it. So because it has these nice big empty forms here, they can be filled with different textures. So this is like a wood block. This is sort of a screen printing half tone gradation texture. And then this is just the stone surface, like a, a lithography stone. And then over here, just kind of playing with the logo itself, making a design out of it. You can see the, the logo kind of going upwards and then rotating. And then it's just two layers um, offset a little bit of the logo four times with different colors overlaying each other in Illustrator. So you guys will learn how to do this kind of stuff, um, overlays and things. And these are just some other applications of the logo. So it works really well because the letters are all kind of bold, and the forms are bold, so it can work nicely against even a complex or a dark background. But here, too, the logo can be blown up so big that it just becomes kind of a design or a very loose decoration. And then here's the, the type itself. So I think that's the last one. Yeah, so that's basically it. Um, yeah, is there any questions about this logo or anything else? I can't remember if I forgot to mention something. Is there anything that you can uh, think of? Well, I can't remember, but I think I just got questions started last time. So okay. uh, what can you guys use from this presentation in your own logo design? What did you get from this? What did, why do you think I brought him here for you? Brave souls. <laughs> Don't worry, the camera won't see you. Yeah, it's not just looking at you, it's just looking at me. It's just a process of developing the logo, starting from like, you know, your own ideas and developing on to finally find a final product. Mm -hmm. So this guy, he does a lot more than logo design, but he's done a lot of logo designs. So I'm going to write a little bit on the board while we're going. Thank you for writing process up. Uh, what did you guys notice about process? What came first? Uh, type. Type came first? Really? What came first? Type was there. It was early. What came first? What was the very first thing? Requirements. Like, what is he trying to design, right? So, can, can we put idea? Sure. Idea? Yep, the idea. So, the, the project or the concept or the, the first step, right, is like, what, did, what needed to be done? Well, they needed a new logo. So, what were the ideas to base the logo around? Yeah. Okay, what next? Type was pretty pretty soon after that. Type, type wasn't 
quite nice. But I'm gonna put I'm gonna put a little space here, and then mm -hmm. I'll put and then I'll put tape. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you for trying. <laughs> Okay, so that might be kind of the idea concept, yes, and that led to something. Sorry if you can't read my writing. Mm -hmm. Even before drafting. I think I heard someone say research, right? Oh. Oh. So what did, what did Kamran research in this case? What did you guys see? What images was he showing you? Oh, for the bank. So some printmaking images, uh, some images having to do with print in Hawaii, right? Okay, so we, we did research. Um, sometimes with logo development, you might make an inspiration board. That, that could be where he put all his images. And we did type. Type. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's part of research too, probably. What happened next? experimenting so like maybe some kind of drafting sketches drafting mm -hmm. we'll do both sketches and drafting okay good some other way so you're not on camera just yell it out what's after that you got some drafts that's that's kind of part of drafting so shapes are part of drafting how did he know if it was good who did he get feedback from Hired him. Oh, he had a he had a client. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Feedback. Great. Yeah. So there's a lot of communication, a lot of back and forth, every step of the way. Um, you know, the way I usually would work on projects is I would do five samples, send it over to the client, have them give me some kind of feedback, like which one do you like or which two two tops, and then they send it back. What do you like about it? And then I look at their notes or their feedback, and then I give them five more samples based on what they told me. And then I'll send those to them. OK, now choose one or two that you like from this set. And then we go again. And so usually it's, I usually try to limit it to like three waves. But sometimes projects do take longer. It just depends. Um, but yeah, the feedback is super important. Because it really helps you know what to focus in on. If you have no feedback, then it's sort of like, well, this one's good, but this one's kind of cool too, and they're totally different. So which one do I choose? So that's where a client can actually be helpful, is tell you what they think as well. So we made some improvements. Yeah. Okay. And luckily they agreed. I guess you talked a little bit about the printmakers um, and their decision making on this mm. last time. I don't know if you want to go into that. Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't know uh, if you were around when we were designing this. So you're on the board, yeah? Yeah, you were. Yeah. So you remember. So um, uh, yeah, when we started working on this logo design, um, you know, Duncan was the main one that we were, I was communicating with. But then I think at a certain point, he also brought it to the board, and you guys voted, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So and I remember getting feedback from different members that had very different opinions, which is natural. We all have different opinions, right, on what we like and what we don't like, and that made it quite difficult in some cases because. There were some members that really liked the old logo. And you know it has all this history and tradition to it, and it's been around for a long time. And to get rid of that old logo, to them, felt very um, kind of, I don't know, impolite or you know, not very respectful to like trash this thing that we had for so long and cover it with something brand new and you know, so, uh, in their eyes, maybe sterile or corporate looking or just overly simple. So there are always people that are going to you know, not like your designs. Or, and then there will be people that will or maybe like them. So that feedback process can be very difficult. Ultimately, I think Duncan, who is the executive director, he was the one that kind of made the call. He's like, well, I like this one the best, so this is the one that we're going to go with. I remember the yeah. discussion. I, yeah. was, I was there. At the you were there. Charged. Yeah. All the reasons that you talked about. Yeah. And um, there were a number of people who wanted to move forward, and it was about uh, rebranding mm -hmm. with this updated, with this very, very uh, uh, new look. Right. And, and I think there was enough people who were behind that, uh, and we did take a vote, and the 
public close. Yeah, and because of the history too, yeah, for the, the printmakers, it's, long history. it's been around for so long. Uh, 90 years now. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of members have been in it for a long time too, so this brand new change is kind of a big thing for them, right? Right, it was, it was very big. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and some people still... They still kind of... Uh, kind of small. We <laughs> resent it. <laughs> yeah. But I, is, I think it was a good choice for the board mm. and for the printmakers. Yeah, I'm glad. You guys probably don't know this, but the Honolulu Printmakers is the oldest running nonprofit or organization dedicated to printmaking west of the Mississippi. And it's all the way up here in the United States. So, um, yeah, so we're pretty yeah, fortunate to have that here and have that community. And it's a very vibrant community. They do a lot of art shows and uh, events related to kind of education and, you know, uh, exhibiting artwork. So, yeah. So, when you guys are moving forward with your logo designs, the nice thing to think about is you are your own client. You guys get to decide exactly what the company's idea is that you're making this for. But you can see how getting those ideas is really important as a first step, right? I think when you guys think about the logos that are most impressive to you in the real world, uh, you might want to reflect on they probably don't show a t-shirt in their logo just because it's a clothing brand, right? That's like the most obvious way of making an image. Um, probably it's a little more sophisticated than that. Simple is not bad. You can see a lot of meaning can be stuffed into simple, right? And now you actually know all the ideas behind this. You guys know why I, I had him come right now? Right after we did our tangrams? <laughs> Pretty see similar, it. yeah. See it? There was, um, I was, this wasn't intentional, I was talking to him earlier, but there was a picture on the Honolulu Printmakers website of this guy, I don't even know who he was, but he's doing a, a shaka this way, right? Like this, with the logo right above it, and I thought it was intentional, I thought it was like... <laughs> that like was part of the logo. Based on yeah, it could be, I guess. <laughs> sort of on that. Um, that was kind of interesting, mm. too. Um, yeah. We also talked about logo types in here, so if you guys are paying attention, you might have seen Kamran's work uh, that he showed you just in this presentation already addressed at least three different logo types. Can you guys name which ones? Do you remember the logo types? Okay, mm -hmm. kind of an ideogram, which is a, a symbol. Uh, I heard typographic, right? What else? Abstract for sure. What else? Pictogram. You think pictogram? Kind of, kind of, maybe, maybe really simple. Maybe. Which one had to do with positive and negative space? Figure ground, very good. He didn't yeah. know that I taught you that. He did all that naturally. <laughs> Just happened to. But most logos do incorporate many of those elements, um, or effective logos. Now, one of the challenges with logos design is you'll get a client, and they have a tendency, um, and it's only natural, but they want the logo to contain everything that the company is about. And that's impossible to do. And even if you try to do it, it's going to look really bad. So. Part of the process of logo design is stripping away what is not necessary to, because this logo doesn't look like, you know, printmaking. When you look at this, you don't necessarily think of, oh, that's, that's a printmaker's logo if you didn't see the text. But that's okay, it doesn't need to. Just like, um, like the Apple logo. Not to say it's the best logo ever, but it's a very simple logo and it doesn't look anything like computers, right? But we are all trained to recognize it and know what it means now. And, and it's an effective logo because it's very easy to recognize. And it's simple and it's clean. So I think generally those are the logos that work better because they're simple, positive, negative space, one color. Um, in this case, geometric really works. I think generally um, there was a question last time about is geometry important in a logo? And I think it definitely can be because we, as a species, um, everywhere on Earth, you know, in our histories, people have always created very simple geometric designs and worked with those designs. So a circle is a universal symbol. And it may represent different things to different people, but the symbol itself is something we all recognize. And a triangle, too, and these simple forms, there's something kind of primal, this connection that we have to these simple forms. So like the projects that you guys are working on um, with all your geometric shapes there, there's some power to those simple forms. 
and we respond to them. So that's something that's kind of cool with geometry. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you do this, do you do this on Illustrator? Yes, good question. It's all done in Illustrator. And I find that Illustrator is really the best thing for logo design. You can do it in Photoshop, but the way Illustrator works, it's really geared to, yeah. And there's a lot of work that you don't see here. Um, a lot of pages of just different ideas and different typefaces that try it and they don't look good at all. And you know, different samples, even like all of these. You know, there's tons that I don't have here that just they didn't work out good, but you kind of have to go through all of that to get to that end point. So Illustrator is really good because it gives you this giant workspace, and then you can create artboards inside of that workspace. And so you can have you know, your working areas on the side here, and then you have your artboards that are kind of like, OK, this is one artboard. And then you know, this is maybe another artboard of the, the eight best logo or the eight best pieces of text. But there's 100 over here that are you know, not as good. And you can kind of distill um, with the Illustrator interface. And it's very easy to copy shapes and you know, paste and duplicate and everything. So yeah. I think it was a good question that came up last class. Mm. Was what if you're stuck on an idea? Oh, yeah. You get stuck, you're burned out, what do you do? So you can do a couple things if you get stuck and you kind of don't know what to do. Um, one thing that I'll do, you know, if, you're sp if you spend five hours staring at the same things and you've been working on it for a while, it all kind of looks bad. You know, after a while, you just get used to it and you're kind of mentally fatigued and you're tired. And so I find a really good thing to do is just give it a little break. So turn off the computer, go do something totally different. Or it could be some other art form, maybe painting or something that's different work process. And I find that when you go back to it, after you give it a long enough break, you go back to it with kind of fresh eyes and a new aptitude to actually, you know, who knows, your mind is still working when you're not thinking, consciously thinking about things. And so you'll go back to it and you might discover like, oh, what if I actually do this instead? Or you, know, you never know what you might come up with. So that's one thing to do, is just give it a break. You know, turn it off. Don't delete everything, but just set it aside for a little while. Come back to it. Um, another thing you can do is try and, so let's say you did a whole bunch of samples based off of one idea. So like, oh, I really want it to reference printmaking. So I've been stuck on just like trying to make it reference printmaking, but I don't know what to do. And I've kind of exhausted all of those possibilities. Well, then maybe let me look at another one of the criteria. And let's try and expand just that one thing. So maybe that would be, OK, simplicity. So not thinking about printmaking, let me just do a bunch of different very simple designs. So it could just be playing with shapes, just the triangles, or the, the kappa pattern, You know, just bringing that in, combining that with simplicity. OK, let me just play with some shapes and see what looks good. And you never know what you might discover in one, um, one branch of experimentation. And then you can kind of take one of this and take one of this and bring it together. And so you can kind of approach it from different ways. So yeah. I want to see if you guys have another question. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long did this project take? Oh, OK. Yeah, so it was probably like a month or so, all in all. Um, and that's not a month of like 9 to 5 every day. But a lot of the time is you, know, you send them some ideas, and then you wait for a response, right? And then you communicate about the, what they mean, and then you incorporate their ideas. So about a month back and forth. Um, Someone asked how many hours, so they said, oh, like 80 hours. And I said, well, maybe. Maybe not quite, but you know, I mean, it's pretty steady. But other logo designs that I've done, it can take, you can do it in a couple of days. Just depends how good they are, the client is at communicating and <laughs> how easy they are to work with. Sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, that's great. And they trust you as the artist. So they kind of defer to your expert opinion, right? And that's a really good situation. Other times, they think they know best. And so they say, oh, no, I, I want it like this. 
but I don't really know how to quite explain that, and so I want you to read my mind and like figure out what I mean without telling you. And so it can be frustrating too. So yeah, every project uh, depends. But usually, you're working on a bunch of different projects at once. So you know, you work on this, you send it out, and then you go to your next project and you work on that. And that's another thing too. If you get stuck on one project, even just working on a different one can help you give, get ideas for the last project. So, yeah. When yep. you send um, your samples to them, is it only like a process of elimination to kind of get down to the very basis of it? Oftentimes it is, yeah. Um, like the way I do it, I'll send five, you know, five or maybe ten samples. Usually I start with five. And they choose, eliminate the four they don't like. And then, okay, this one, they might say, I like that, but I don't really know what I like about it. And if you can't get them to give you more information, which sometimes they just can't vocalize it, right? Then you say, OK, well, let me do iterations. So versions of that that are slightly different. And then see which one of those they like the best. And then eliminate the rest. And I always keep the ones that I eliminate. Just keep them around. But you can copy the one they like and put it in a new artboard. That way you have the old stuff to refer to if you ever need it. But um, yeah, I usually do three waves of that. So five, choose the best one. Five more from that one they chose, choose the best one. And then five more. And then I say, OK, now choose, choose the one you like best, and that's going to be the logo. Or maybe you'll do little tweaks to it, and that's the logo. And then if they say, oh, I want to keep going, usually I work it into a contract where I say, for this price, I'm going to give you three sets of five ideas. At the end of that, that's what you paid for. If you want me to keep working, then you can charge them hourly or have some other arrangement with them. But that protects you from people doing like, oh, wait, let's do some more. Oh, wait, just a couple more changes, a couple more changes. Because if there are no limits, people will just keep doing that. you know. So you got to like set it from the beginning. And they'll never really fight with you on that if you're just clear at the beginning. You say, for this price, I'll give you these this many ideas. And then that, that's what it is. So, yeah. Yep. How did you, uh, in like a professional workspace, mm -hmm. how did you get this job? So, actually, as a designer, I've just always worked for myself. Um, well, when I was in New York, I worked for a company. But other than that, when I moved back, um, yeah, I've always just done freelance. And that's really, it's hard to say. You have to start out doing some stuff for either free or friends or just to get experience and to build your portfolio. Ultimately, that's what will get you jobs is your portfolio. So then when you do find somebody that either they need a logo or you know, I've applied for jobs on Craigslist. You can get logo jobs that way too. And you can say, here's my portfolio. Um, are you interested in you know, me designing a logo for you? Sometimes you can tell them a price up front. Other times you can ask where their budget is. But it kind of starts. You have to have a portfolio to start with to show people. And then they'll kind of say, oh, OK, you, you've proven yourself. You can do this, so I trust you. But if you have no portfolio, they really have to take a chance with you, right? So you need the portfolio first. Yeah. And then it's just like word of mouth. And over time, you develop. Now, if you work for a company, it's a lot easier because you don't have to actually go out and find clients, right? Usually they come to the company. So there's pros and cons with that. Yeah. But in this case, you are a printmaker too. So you're the graphic yes. designer and a printmaker within the organization. You're trusted, you know, mm -hmm. the executive director has a similar sense of style to Kamran, so it was an easy choice for him, right? He said, I know you can do this, and yeah. I know I will like what you make, so. <laughs> Yeah, he, he trusted me, and he knew me well enough so that he could kind of assign me the task. And he has a good aesthetic, and he's a great artist, but he's not necessarily a designer. So he didn't feel like he would, I don't know, confident that he could do a good job. So he, in this case, he asked me to step in and help out. So yeah. I have a question. Yeah, sure. This always comes up with logo design. So I'm mm. 
I, I know that you designed this logo primarily in black and white, but obviously it's versatile. Mm -hmm. Students always have questions about how do you choose colors mm. for designs? How do you go about choosing yeah. colors? For logos specifically or just for For general? now, for logos okay. specifically, yeah. Um, some things to think about. So I feel like a logo, in my opinion, should always work in black and white. So make sure it works in black and white either first or also. But if you really do want to incorporate color, color is a great way to add vibrancy or interest. Um, I mean, especially reds and warm colors, they pop out, right? We, we respond to them. They're energizing. So it depends what kind of feeling you want your logo to, um, to communicate. And it can also be the concept of the company. So if it's like a surfboard company, then it would make sense to have a blue or you know, blue-green or something referencing water, right? Because that's the content or the, the company's concept. Um, so you can kind of think about that in terms of color. If there's not really a color that goes along with, like, let's say, computer company. I mean, computers are all gray and like black and silver and white, right? So there's not really any color in there. So then it's sort of up to you. What's the, the feeling of the company or what kind of um, what kind of feeling do they want their company to have? Maybe it's a really boring, like, old world company, and they're trying to make it hip and fun and upbeat. Well, in that case, adding a bright color might be what they want. So then you could try, like, a nice light orange or, um, you know, something like that. But stick to a couple colors. I would say if you're going to use color, probably don't use more than two or three in a single logo. If you have too many colors, it's just going to look too kind of crazy. And so most of my logo work is black and white, or maybe one color. And when you have one color, that color is emphasized, right? Because it's one color against the white background. So the color becomes very important. So yeah, I think simplicity. And just be aware that a really bright color is going to be intense. So if you want it to, be, to feel intense, then Maybe it works. But if you want it to be a little bit more subdued and subtle and um, simple or streamlined, then a muted color might work. So those are some things to think about. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> uh, yeah. How do you stop yourself from doing too much? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, this is where it's also helpful to have a client. And so they will, hopefully, they'll tell you kind of like, oh, that's, that looks good, or that's on the right direction. And then you kind of refine down from that point. At a certain point, you should feel kind of like, ideally, you'll feel kind of content with the design. And even if you're not, hopefully, they are content. Now, if, if you're not content, you still feel like, oh, I should keep working on this and they're not content and they want you to keep working on it too, then you might look at, I mean, that's a hard question because experience is kind of one thing you learn too. If you overwork something, then it tends to get too complicated or you get too far from the, the original, like the core of the idea. So I would say look back at your criteria, you know, those five things they want, and see if you're still close to what you should be focusing on. And even if maybe there's one of those things that you haven't hit yet, um, don't worry about it for now. If, if you're hitting all the rest, then kind of just keep working on it and see what, see what happens that way. But yeah, I think experience is one of the things that you, you kind of learn what works and what doesn't. And get people's feedback. You know, In your class, ask someone else what they think about it. And they might give you some good feedback. And they might say, you know what, that's done. Or I actually liked. You know, an hour ago I saw you working, and I liked before you added that, that dot. It looked better without it. And then you can kind of work that way with your teacher, but also with your peers. So feedback is really helpful. Yeah. I've got time for one more question, if anyone has. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, how much would you charge the time? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's one of those questions. It's a, it's a tough thing to answer. Because it depends on experience, how long you've been doing logos for. Um, depends on the client, too. 
it's a big company. They probably have a good chunk of money devoted towards the project. Um, this Honolulu Printmakers is a nonprofit, and so I actually did this for them pro bono. So they didn't pay me for the project, but it was sort of like, you know, this, they don't have a lot of money, and I'm a, one of the members, and so it was a good project to work on. And it was also a great portfolio piece. So that's another thing that you can think of as part of your payment, is if you make a good piece, and usually if they're not paying you, they will be a little more understanding and you can kind of make it a little bit more of what you want. Um, so it represents you well. So to give you a real rough answer though, um, if you're designing a logo for somebody, think about it this way. They're gonna keep this logo and use it, if it's a company, for who knows how many years, indefinitely. And this is the face of the company to many people. So when they see that, logo, they're going to think of that company, right? So it represents them. It's a really important thing for the company to have a good logo. So you shouldn't, well, I wouldn't charge less than 100 bucks for a logo design. But um, that's kind of the starting point. Uh, but again, it does depend on the company. And it depends how many waves you do. So I might say, OK, I'll give you three sets of five designs for $250. And then if you want more, then it'll be charged at $30 an hour, or whatever rate you think is fair. Um, or you can say, any more designs other, after that or $100 per every five, or whatever. So you can kind of make these little increments. But it really, yeah, it really depends. And if you, whatever price you charge, you should be willing or ready to back that up if they question you. like well, why are you charging that much? Then you should have a good answer for that. You can say, well, this is what I've done, blah, blah, blah. And it took this many hours. And at $40 an hour, that equals this much, or whatever. So just make sure you have an answer in case they do ask why you're charging what you're charging. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Thank All right, you, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.